actually have this here for two reasons. One, uh, it is a hash. Um, and two, because we've been so jerked around getting this here, we called it, it came from Poland, it came from a, a group of people that uh, are military enthusiasts uh, in Poland, and they do a lot of work, and they supply museums with parts, and we've had our T-54 over there get a, uh, a new starter from them, we've had our BMP-1, we got a clutch, new clutch from, from them, we got a whack of stuff. Uh, anyways, I was over there with uh, one of our members, Dave out there, he's not here, Dave Malby. He and I went over to Poland three years ago, over three years ago, when we looked at getting these Belgian leopard, leopard ones. And I saw that they had a hexer in one of their bays that it was, they did a beautiful job, it was amazing. And then they had this older rust bucket set aside that they hadn't got to yet you know, before you restore something. And we were just, we ended up getting, buying two leopards from them. And we did some test driving and everything while we were over there. So then, after, I always remembered seeing this over there. And I also, always remember the work they did and how they, they restored uh, this, another Hetzer. And it was amazing. It's museum quality stuff. And they did the same to the, the, the student three that I saw them working on. And again, I was just amazed. So I always had this in the back of my mind. So I would say about a year after that, so I guess it was maybe four years ago I was there, um, we negotiated and we cut a deal. And they said that, you know, this is a two year, almost two years. I think it worked out to be 22 months. So we had an agreement that this would be done in 22 months. And we, you know, we obviously came to terms on price and delivery and that kind of stuff. So, it was supposed to have been ready last October, a year ago, contractually. And they got it done, and things were, and then, okay, so now it's a question of, okay, do we have to get it from Warsaw, Poland, to here? That's where the fun began. That's why this was a year getting here. And I'll tell you why we call it, we said until now, it had the Polish curse. It's been removed now, everything's cool, so don't worry, we're all right. This, uh, the Polish government felt that because this is an antique and an artifact, that it's part of the po Polish cultural. They own it, it's a cultural thing, it's a heritage thing for them. So they would set up within the government a heritage group that would assess it. So they assessed it, and they were supposed to get a ruling on it, and they didn't think it was that, but then they kicked it to another group. So literally, it was nine months in the Polish government's hands deciding whether or not they would even release this out of the country. All right. So we finally get that cleared up 10 months later. So we start bringing it here. This is where the curse continues. This got shipped from Warsaw to uh, a port near Gdansk. Uh, in Poland. And then from there, it got on a ship, and it was shipped to a, an Estonian port. From there it went on a different ship to Bremerhaven, if I'm saying that correctly, in Germany. It's a free port. And this was put on what was called a mafi. Uh, not a mafia, but a mafi, and it, it's a huge, big metal skid with wheels. Because we didn't want anyone starting this up and jerking around with this. This thing, like this thing, is extremely expensive, and it's an artifact, and it's been restored. It's a complete runner. I don't know if any of you were here. We just moved it all around. Uh, just an amazing piece. So, anyways, it sits in Bremerhaven. We're waiting for it to be shipped to Halifax. It goes on the milk run that goes to Halifax. Well, it's we're told it's on a ship. The ship's halfway across, I don't know what the name, I think the name was Toledo, the ship. And it was supposed to get in on a certain day in Halifax. Well, we get a message from, you know, through the ship, because they've got, you know, email, all this stuff. They can't find the bill of lading on the ship for the tank. Oh, and another small thing, they couldn't find the tank. The Hetzer, where's the Hetzer? It was like, where's Waldo, where's the Hetzer? So, turns out, it wasn't even on that ship. It was still in Germany. 
going on the next ship that was going to do the milk run to come out to Halifax. So anyway, we ended up with it. When we got it out there, it doesn't end there. It lands in Halifax. Ken, is Kenny here? He's not here. Kenny, uh, one of our key guys, been here forever. We fly him down, put him up in a hotel. He's going to go. He's going to start it up. He gets in it. Battery's dead. Master switch was left on. We got no juice. He's up in Halifax. So they end up winching it up because he didn't want it anyways. Long story short, it's here. The curse is lifted. And it's amazing. So let's talk about the Hetzer. Why would the Germans use... Let's talk about the name Hetzer. That's a point. You read a book, you listen to a video on this thing, and they'll, they'll either say, yeah, okay, they, they adopt the name or they don't. It's not... It's not a name that was given on a, on a usual basis during the war. This is the... The Yagda Panzer 38T. T stands for, uh, actually, it's the symbol uh, that they use to denote uh, Czechoslovakia, because this was built in Czechoslovakia. And it was designed after Czechoslovakian tank, the chassis was. So, the name Hetzer. Turns out that, that after the war, long after the war, some people writing on tanks found out that Heinz Guderian. Field Marshal Guderian, one of the, 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 the founders of modern uh, armored warfare, he wrote down that when this thing was introduced to the troops, the troops loved it, and they affectionately called it the Hetzer. Hetzer meaning chaser in German, or Bader. It's one of the two words, depending on what dialect of German you're, you're saying. So that's with the name. Most people call it, it's the, the Yagda. Yagda means hunting. Panzer hunting like tank hunter. Yagda Panzer 38T. Now let's talk about the development where it came from. Why did they build this? Why did they end up with this tank? Well, it came out at the end of the war, near the end of the war. It was only like 14 months of actual production. And they ended up making about 26, 2,800 of these in total. And that was still pretty good given. Uh, given the conditions, the wartime conditions of trying to make these. When the Allies are bombing the hell out of all your supply lines and all your uh, bearing factories and all this other stuff. The problem the Germans had in World War II, first was getting into it, was probably the first problem, but more appropriately, what turned things around when they got bogged down in Russia. The Russian military machine in producing vehicles was unbelievable. Their T-34, by the way, we've got one coming on the 21st of November, an original Russian T-34 is coming here. It's another acquisition that we've got. It's incredible. That was what the Russians kept pumping out, pumping out. And then they had a lot of big tanks above that. The Americans and the Allies were, were greasing out in huge numbers was the Sherman tanks that we have right there. So the Germans, they didn't have it. They, they, they needed something that would be cheap, and they needed something to slow down the Russian onslaught of armor. They had something, they introduced something uh, in, in approximately 1942, it's called the Martyr III. Martyr III. The Martyr III uh, it was, a, it was a tank hunter, again, but it was different layout. It was built on uh, a, 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 what the Germans called it, a Panzerkampfwagen. 38T, and that was of the Czech uh, 38T. Uh, it was called a medium tank. Today you would call it a yeah. car because it, it was so lightly armored. But the Germans had oh, several hundred of those when they invaded Russia in the first place. That supplemented the, all the German tanks. But it was a proven chassis, proven suspension, proven gearbox, and powertrain overall. And they went with that, and they put this martyr, they put a, a, like a Pac-40, a heavy-duty anti-tank gun on it. But it sat really high, and it had virtually no armor. Like it might, maybe a, a, you couldn't fire through it in a, with a rifle, but any kind of uh, uh, armored vehicle or anti-tank gun would take it out easy. And again, it sat high. It probably, look at the height of this. This from a tank or an armored vehicle in World War II is very small. Compare it 
compared to the Shermans over there. Even compared to these other ones, the, the uh, centurion we have. This is very small. The martyr tree was very high. So one, they wanted more protection, more protection for the people in it. They wanted it to last, not only hard hitting, but you have to be able to take a shot. So they developed this. This came out, and it, interestingly enough, when they were looking at the development of this in 43, early 43, they were intrigued by a design the Romanians had. Romanians come up with a, a, a I'm probably not going to pronounce it right, it's Marsala. Uh, and the Romanians were looking at, they, they didn't have all the abilities to manufacture the parts for it. So they were sourcing those parts. This is during World War II. Sourcing the parts in Germany. The Germans were looking at it. And the German military got involved and looked at it. And actually, the high command, including Hitler, actually looked at this thing. And it was very similar to this. Probably the armor was tapered. This wasn't as wide up here. And it was tapered the same in the rear as it was in the front. A very different idea. So the Germans looked at that. And just like, you know, we always say how the Chinese look at a design and mimic it and make their own. The Germans did something very similar. They come up with something like this. And they thought, okay, well, if we're going to build this, what are we going to put it on? Because those of you that are into tanks and stuff, you remember the Panther, when they brought up the Panther tank, it had a lot of heating problems. You know, gear ratios, it had power, underpowered, overpowered. You know, they had a lot of breakdowns. Well, why not build it on a proven chassis? The 38T medium tank they used at the beginning of the invasion of Russia proved itself. It was amazing. They used that same thing for the martyr tree. It could really dish out, but it couldn't take a hit. So they wanted something lower, something cheap. So they actually looked at it. They looked at the, the and if you looked at a martyr tree and looked at this, the sides down there, the road wheels, they look the same, but they're actually different. They're different in the sense they're more robust. The suspension has been more robust. The track looks the same, but in fact, it's a little wider. The road wheels look the same, the side view, but in fact each road wheel, you see these big wheels on the side, they're actually bigger than what was on the, the 38T and what was used for the Martyr 3. So they went with, they beefed it up, and at first, the first several, or I shouldn't say, the first production run, this, this mantle on the side, you see this it's, uh, pig snout, they call it a pig snout on the front? It was way too heavy, and when you fired, when you when you were driving it, it was too much power, too much pressure on the forward, all the gears, the bearings, and the drive track. And as such, it sat forward. So they ended up taking off about 300 kilos from this, and they tended to balance it out a little. And that's what they ran with, with minor modifications to the end of the war. So it was pretty impressive. So. What else? This is, it's got a Praga, um, I believe it's a 160 horsepower petrol engine in it, in this. And, and the interesting part is the gearbox. The gearbox in it, it's a pre-select. It's called a uh, Praga um, Wilson gearbox. Now, German, Wilson, interesting. You see that white vehicle right there? The Ferret, that Ferret Scout car right there. That one was built in 1954. They built them right up to the middle 70s. <coughs> that has a Wilson pre-select gearbox in that one right there. Same type. When I got in this thing a year ago, I was in Poland test driving this. It was all beige. They didn't put on this ambush pattern. It's called an ambush pattern. Uh, camouflage. And I'm driving it. I didn't know about the power train. He says, yeah, it's the Praga Wilson. I said, Wilson? He says, yeah, then you pre-select it. It's like a clutch, you know, you push the clutch in, you shift the gear, you push the clutch out, you give it gas, that's a clutch. Where the pre-select is, you put it in first, you push the button in, release it, and then you give it gas and, and it drives. You don't have to feed it out. And then you're driving in first, you switch it into second, but it stays at first until you push the pedal and then release it, then it goes on this after. So it's pre-select. Some people call it a semi-automatic. It's not really right, but anyway. 
imagine that, the technology here, Wilson was still used over there. And the British used it in some of their uh, designs as well, the armored vehicle in World War II. The gun. The gun is a Pack 39. It's a 75 millimeter. Uh, we got a different shell out. We're going to have there's some sample shells in here. We just got this a couple days ago. So this is fresh off the truck. And, um, and it purrs up pretty nice. What we could do uh, when we're done talking here, we could fire it up. And you can hear, hear the sound of a World War II. This is exactly the way it was. You know, it's been restored. You know, a real engine, real gearbox, sounds the same. This is, it is, it's so cool. Now, the crew. This was considered to be cheap to make, hard hitting. This thing could take out anything the Soviets had. The bigger tanks, you had to get a little closer to them. These things sat in hiding. They sit in hiding. And it's funny because Hunter, you know, if, if you talk about Hetzer, the term Hetzer and, and Chaser, it would imply Chase. This should be, it should have a name that means wait and kick ass because that's kind of what it does. It waits in a camouflage environment and it, this thing can take it out. It's the same thing, but you, you, have, you have the people protected. Your crew's protected now. But let's talk about the protection. You see the slope on this? This, when you look at this thing, everyone knows. Those of you that play World of Tanks, and you know that. Those of you that have been to Tank Museum, this thing looks like damn near nothing else. It's very cool. I mean, the, the angles of it, I shouldn't say cool, it's very distinct, it's very uh, noticeable. So, there's only 60 millimeters of armor here. 60 millimeters. But it's on a 60 degree angle. That means it gives it almost 120 millimeters of armor on the front. That was to protect the troops. That's more armor than our Sherman tanks World War II had. And that was the latest Sherman tanks. That was the last version, the latest, the newest, that were built for World War II. That's the one with the Easy 8 That's the same as Fury on television. This had more frontal armor. Now here's the Achilles heel. There's a few of them. Here's the first one. The side armor. 20 millimeters. Not 60, 20. You had a bit of a slope, so maybe you got equivalent of maybe 30 max. And there's not much on the rear. All this was clearly a defensive weapon. So this had two purposes. Two purposes. It was to take out tanks, anti-tank, number one. Number two was to support the infantry, defensively and offensively. So, in that end, this was extraordinarily successful. This should never have been used in isolation. This only could have been used effectively with infantry support all around you. Now you'll notice, let's talk about what I just said there. This is very cool. Look at this thing up here. This is, in German it means all around machine gun. You can go down below in this. You have a, a belt. This is an MG34. You have a belt of 50 rounds that you can attach to the side of that. You go down below there, and there's like a, it's like an MB in a U-boat. You bring down the two handles like that, and you're looking at a scope. There's a scope that goes right down there and shoots out. And you're down there, you're looking at it, and you got a thing to fire the gun, the machine gun. You can do a 360 with this thing from down below, never getting out. You can tilt it up, tilt it down. Um, obviously, if someone's right here close beside you, you can't get out. it. But that's the beauty of this. The Stug 3, uh, those of you that saw the Stug, it was a Stug replica that we had in that far corner there. It had a flip-up uh, shield and the gunner was behind it and he fired the gun. Later, the stew was fitted with this type of thing. I believe it was used in the Hetzer first, and then it was introduced to the stews, and it was very effective. So that's one of the things there that it has. Big benefit that this had over the, uh, mainly Russian tanks, were the, were the optics. 
These are amazing optics. It's the same optics that's in this tube. It's the same manufacturer that all of the optics were made in the German armor. Big benefit over all Russians, especially at the beginning of the war, when they were up against the T-34 initially, and they, they were fighting against a, a far superior tank, but their, their uh, organizational skills, the command structure, and their ability to target and hit on, on if not the first shot, the second or third shot, whereas the Russians would be shooting all over the place. The optics they had were not that good, not till the latter part of the war when they started getting a better handle on it. The crew, the crew, the infantry loved it. I got a couple, I'm gonna read a couple quotes from official reports from German in the field, but the crew didn't like this too much. I mean, look at the size of it. There was four crew members in here. We had right up here, a driver. You see there's two periscopes for the driver right there. You see those black bars down there? I remember when I, when I first saw them in a picture, I said, what the hell would they be for? Like, what would they be for? They're decoys. Because what the Russians and the Allied troops were told was that go, you, if you're going to hit it, you're going to be fighting against the Hetzer, the front of the armor is thick. So aim for the optics. So what they did is they gave them two other phony, look like periscope slots from a distance, it would look real. And when they hit, tried to hit those, well that's the thickest part of the armor, the front. There, with your angle, there's the 120 millimeters of armor that you would have on that angle. So that's it there. So you had one driver here, he only had those two scopes, two uh, periscopes looking out. Right behind him, you had the gunner. The gunner, the, the gunner, he would actually do this, and this thing, as this gun rotated, and this gun, because it doesn't have a turret, you, you got limited traverse. So this, the specs that they wanted on this was to have a 30 degree spin. Not spin, but you, like without moving the tank, without moving the vehicle, you can go 30 degrees. Unfortunately, you, you notice the gun is slightly off center, it's over here, because it's so narrow, it had to be off center to get these three people here, as well as, when you, it has a minimal, I think it's a, a five degree turn to the left, where you can crank it, it'll turn to the left. Turn to the right, see the back end would swing this way down. You wouldn't butt up against the wall, so you've got a, a 15 degree there. So you had, you had 5 and 15, so what do you got, 21 degree, they wanted 30. So anyways, that was one of the downsides. All assault guns like this, uh, even the Stug, you had limited turn. And the downside of that, of having a small amount, is that you got to keep your engine running. If your engine is running, you're not hearing what's going on or who's around you or gunfire as much. And people could hear, hear you. Hopefully they're not, they don't see any smoke you got going down here. Um, Right behind, okay, so we got the driver, we got the gunner, and here we've got the loader. So the loader was busy. The loader was not only on the comms, the radios are right behind me here, below, it's all fitted with radios. We've got the loader. The loader was in an awkward position because the gun was designed, it, it was a pack, pack 39. It was designed to be on the ground with big wheels around it, and the loader would be on this side, feeding the rounds in. But here the loader's over here, he's manning this machine gun if need be, he's on the comms as required, and now you've got him leaning over a guard that's in there, because there's rounds near him to the side and by his feet, but there's also rounds stored along this side, ammunition, big long 75 millimeter rounds stored along that side. He's got to reach those and feed it in. And then the gunner fires, and he tells them when it's loaded, the gunner fires. Right back here, here you've got the commander. And this whole thing opens up. The commander, more often than not, left these hatches open. Because he's got no forward scope. And he's back here. You've got, look at, the, what have you got here? You've got, here we've got a side periscope. Uh, we're still, that's still, we haven't received a, an original one yet. It's, it's on its way as soon as they, they, they source it. 
So this guy's got a view here with a periscope. The driver could look out that way, two little scopes. The gunner's looking through here, but that's the gunner scope. It's, it's all in sync with the barrel. And then back here you've got the commander's scope, but it looks backwards. He's got no forward scope. Now inside here, if you open it up, um, we have those two typical uh, butterfly, uh, you know, they're, they come down to a base, you know, they come out like that, and they're down here. But while he's doing that, that was one of the challenges. And you can imagine the commander, more often, turn that off, more often than not, he's got his hat up seeing what's going on. Now, if he's out in the open, he's going to be dead meat. But if he's sitting there, you know, all the camouflage is dug in, it's probably not a big deal. But it still makes you vulnerable. Okay, well, we'll look at it. Don't worry about it, guys. We'll look at it. That, uh, there's a, a pinto that, from here, if I'm sitting in there and I'm the, I'm the, uh, I'm the commander, there's a pinto, you swing around, it's got these, these twin binoculars, and, and then you raise it on this other one. Like it pivots around and comes up. And you can stay down below and you've got these two binoculars going down, and they act as kind of a, a, a range finder as well as uh, giving you clarity on quite a distance. So the optics, there you see them there. So the guy can stay below, and look, we can, look there's a smaller hatch that can protect him, but you're still limited even with those. You can't quickly see to the right or the left. You're just looking straight ahead. But this is great for target acquisition. And frequently, he would be speaking to the gunner as to what what uh, what target to acquire. It's out there. You know, T-34 coming over the hill, you know, 500 or you know, 1,200 meters to your left or right or whatever. So that's... Uh, I'm trying to wonder what else we've got here. This, this vehicle, well, you know what, I'm probably going to read to you. Here's a, an official report, German report on this. The light Panzer uh, Jaeger 38, they call it, uh, has come through its baptism of fire. The crews are proud of their vehicles. They themselves, like the infantry, have confidence in them. The all-around fire machine gun mentioned with special praise because they didn't have that. The big concern was if, if they can get close to them. Um, strong weapon, strong weapon effect. This was an amazing weapon. It could take out a lot. Um, little overall height, short, compared to what was in the field, and favorable shaping. That's the sh obviously the shaping for, for being able to take a hit, especially on the front. Prove its full suitability for its two main tasks, fighting enemy tanks, and then direct support of infantry in attack and defense. I mentioned that earlier. One company of Hetzers shot down 20 tanks in a short time without any total losses of its own. Another company destroyed 57 tanks, including two Stalins. They're huge. You've got the you've got the um, T-34. You've got the KV-1s, and then near the end of the war, when these were introduced, you had the Stalins, the Tigers. Tiger tanks had a challenge taking out the Stalin. But if you get close enough, in 800 meters, that's pretty close. I would almost think maybe that might be optimistic. But it says they took them out. It's a battlefield report. Um, and no losses of its own from enemy fire. The same unit reached its destination after a day's march of 160 kilometers without breakdown. Going back to the point that the chassis and the powertrain are proven. This thing was built on something that was proven. So it's, um, that's the big challenge when you, when you introduce a tank. From the moment this was conceived to the first one that was built, it was four months. That was pretty good. If any of you ever are into any of the Luftwaffe, any of the World War II Luftwaffe, if I'm not mistaken, they had a record. There was a, uh, 
a, a jet fighter, it was called the People's Fighter, it had a single Jumo jet on the back of it, and it would take off. They didn't make a lot of them because the whole war kind of ended, but it went from drawing board to production, I think it was uh, 76 days, probably a record of all time. And it was a flying, battle-worthy uh, aircraft that was produced. So anyway, you know, they say circumstances uh, dictate, you know, what you do, and definitely the Germans' back was to the wall, and they were in, a, they got themselves into a mess, and they had no, they were just delaying the inevitable forever, hoping for a peace in my, in my mind. This was one of those vehicles that did it. Now, let's talk about this particular, I've talked about the Hetzer, I give you a sense of, 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 of uh, how, I told you how we got it, where it came from. It came from Poland, but where did it come from before that? And what's the exact origin of this particular vehicle? This vehicle was acquired um, from a, a Swiss museum and the company called Panzerfarm, they traded it for a T-3485. And they got this and this sat derelict. And I think I told you I saw this, it was four years ago. And um, the history of this vehicle, we look at it, the steel, we have German stampings. We call it Waffenfarb, we got, a, we got a, a, an eagle stamp, and then underneath it's a supplier code. It's denoting, it's Third Reich, it's German World War II. At the end of World War II, after they produced about 2,500, 2,600, the Czechoslovakian government, being the entrepreneurs they were at the time, they did this with other vehicles as well, including uh, 250, 251 Hanamags. They basically went into the uh, factory that was producing these, and um, they they had quite a few. There was you can imagine it, when the war ended, they were still producing. They were rolling these out at the end of the line. So when it ended, they had all kinds of vehicles still in there, and they had all kinds of plate steel and guns and road wheels and everything. So the Czech was uh, sorry. The, the Czechoslovakian sold. 158 of those vehicles, sorry, some of them, I think there was 10, 10 or 15 that were, were pretty well done, but they never rolled off the line. And there was a whack of them that were partially assembled. So they continued to produce them till they end up making 180 of them. And so it was after the war, this is 1946, a year after the war ended, they cut the deal, and the Czechoslovakian government sold 158 of them to Switzerland. Israel wanted to buy 50 of these, and they were negotiating a price, because they were going pretty reasonable, because most of the parts they had there, they were all sitting in, in, uh, in the warehouses and in the, on the assembly line. And they ended up not doing the deal. So Israel did not buy any of these, because they could get the Shermans, who there was thousands of thousands of Shermans not blown up at the end of the war. Remember, we won. No Shermans went back. They didn't repatriate. They didn't, Canada did not bring any Shermans back. The U.S. didn't bring any Shermans back. So they were either scrapped or they were sold to other countries. And so the Israelis, for half the price of one of these, rolling off the line, they bought a whack of them. Otherwise, we would have seen these in Israeli service. I thought that was kind of interesting to hear about that. So this was one of those vehicles that was produced uh, on the line after the war um, with uh, German parts, some of which were made during the war that still bear the markings, some of which were fabricated after the war. We don't know all of which, only of what we know what's here. This, the... Uh, the Swiss bottom with the petrol Praga engine, and then in 1950, uh, they converted about 68 of them to diesel. This one was converted to diesel. When it was received in Warsaw, there was no powertrain in it, there was no diesel engine, no nothing, it was just, it was all gutted. But what was left in there were all the engine mounts for the Praga engines and for the uh, the Praga Wilson uh, pre-select gearbox. 
So this was put back together. A Praga engine was acquired, the exact one, exact, the exact same type, as well as the gearbox. And this has all been put back. Um, when you go inside, there's probably only one difference between this and the wartime production of Hetzers, and that is a traverse. Remember I told you this limited, you can go five degrees one way, I think it's uh, uh, 15 or 16 the other way. That, th there's a lever that does that. That is slightly different than the original wartime Hetzer. This has that. The lights were different. This has been totally remade back to the way it would have been. As a lot of our vehicles are, when you buy them in wartime production or shortly after wartime production, there's changes. We modify them back to the way they would have been at the time when they were made. And this is a very similar type situation. So this vehicle uh, has had the powertrain re reinstated. This German, or sorry, this master gun, it's a pack. This particular one is a pack 40 and, and it had a muzzle brake on it, which has been removed. That had all German markings, Eagle Swastikas on it. The breech and the cannon itself has all the German proof marks all over it, as does the sights, as does this, because this was not put on. This is all original equipment, all the sights. The, the exhaust at the back has been changed slightly back to the original. If you look back there, you might find it interesting. There's a big cone kind of thing about like that diameter. It's around the end of the exhaust coming out. Kind of makes you wonder what that's for. It, it actually, it's a flame hider. If you want to hide this thing and you're going to run start up that engine, the last thing you want is someone seeing a little bit of flame when you fire it up, being petrol, it's more prone to give you a little flame up the back end. That's a flame protector or a hider. And, uh, <laughs> All the kit, the jacks, board, everything is as it was. The interesting part, you know, when I was, we, we were considering acquiring this thing, well, hey, wait a minute. This isn't, you know, wartime, 100% production. I mean, it's as close as you're ever going to get. But then they said, well, you could add another million bucks if it did, if it was. Because there's only, there's only a handful of them. You could count them on, on, on two hands. That it's still out there. Museum. Uh, you probably say the the Bobbington Tank Museum, if I'm not mistaken, has two, if not three, Hetzers. Uh, one of theirs is a is uh, a Swiss manufacturer, Czechoslovakia manufactured, as was the German, but sold to the Swiss. They call it a G13, 13 because of the weight, 13 tons. And um, Duxford. Very large museum in England. The only hatcher they have is one of these G13s. If you do, those of you that follow the Chieftain and look at the reviews that he has on all different kinds of tanks and armored vehicles and that kind of stuff, his review is on a G13. What are these? These are around. Uh, these are, well, there was only 158 of them. And I know, so there's probably about 20 or 30 of these around. The, the, all the rest of uh, they're gone. They're not around anymore. They, like everything else, were scrapped and destroyed. Went out on a uh, as a range target, or they were they were uh, cut up as scrap. So that's the story on the Hetzer. Um, I'm not sure if I left out anything, but you know the base. You know how we got it. It's, we're very happy to have this. You'll notice that we have the idea of this is not just to have it and have it sitting out on a concrete pad or have it in a display. Bobbington, I think, have, brings their Hetzer out. They have a Hetzer, running Hetzer, that comes out. I think that's about it. Oh, there is one in Samoor. The one in Samoor, that's, you think of Bobbington Tank Museum? The one that had, the tank museum that has the most tanks in the world is Samoor. Uh, Musée de Blind, the museum, Armour Museum. Blind, Blind, I'm not saying it right, but anyway. They have one, and, and theirs runs in that. They run that, um, they show that on, on, on their annual, they call it a carousel. That's where they bring out all their tanks. That's when Jeremy and I went over and toured it, and I was standing by a King Tiger. Not a Tiger One, the Tiger Two, a King Tiger. The only one running in the world. It fired up right beside me. 
And Jeremy, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy, we're all videotaping, all excited. It's just amazing. A king tiger. I had to move him so he didn't get run over by the king tiger. He, he says, move, move. And I says, no, I want to scar. I want to scar to say that the, the, the king tiger bit me. Anyways, um, my point being that, that uh, this is uh, very representative and I think a very proud and welcome addition to this, uh, this museum, you'll probably notice in the last 12 months in the Panzer III, you know, that's a replica, but it's one-to-one. -one. I mean, again, the Chieftain does tours of this thing. I mean, not only on the outside, real track, dimensionally bang on. We've got two half tracks. We've got another replica uh, stew that is, is, is in my garage over the winter. It's gonna be modified even further. It's got over a hundred or 120 authentic, real World War II stoop parts on it. Um, and I started to say, and I'll, I'll close with this, you know, we bring history to life. We've got, you see our we have German reenactors here. These guys come out when we do our tank days and we have our big shows. And I'm telling you, if it doesn't run, we don't want it. Let me rephrase that. Give it to us, we'll get it running. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any questions? Yes.